the fourth chapter of John. Hope you got your Bible because I'm going to read a pretty good portion here, starting in the first. Uh, the fourth verse of John 4, John 4, 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. <coughs> now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, about lunchtime, six hours after daylight. And there comes a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat or food. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he's come, he'll tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the, the woman, or literally a woman. Yet no man saith, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city, and they came unto him. In the meantime, his disciples prayed or asked him, saying, Master, eat. But he saith unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Has anybody brought him anything to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say ye not, there are yet four months, then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white, already to harvest. By the way, when this was first spoken, Jesus was indicating all these Samaritans that came out of the city to see him. Those were the harvest fields in the original sentence here. And he that reapeth receives wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap whereon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and you were entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that, I, that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry or stay with them, and he abode or stayed there two days. 
And many more believed because of his own word. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the word of God here. And we just ask you to bless the preaching. In Christ's name, amen. I, I cut off a verse. Let me read one. And, and he said to the woman, they, the, the ones that believed said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we've heard him ourselves. And know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. All right, this is an interesting story to me. It's a large passage here in the fourth chapter of John. But uh, it begins with um, Jesus being led of God. He had to go through Samaria. The, the first thing we read, John 4, 4, says he, I like that in the King James, says he must needs go through Samaria. The, the Jews, I've said this before, that there, there's probably never any racial conflict between blacks and whites in this country any worse than there was between the Jews and the Samaritans in that country. The Samaritans, who were they? They were the people that had been left behind when in the Old Testament Israel had been carried off to Babylon. After 70 years of captivity, the time of Israel comes back and these Samaritans that were left behind because they were the country dwellers. They were the poor folks, and they weren't carried off from the, from the cities like the, the other ones were. And in the meantime, they had uh, married into the other people of the land, so the Jews looked at them uh, in a lot of ways with disgust. They weren't pure anymore. And the Jews hated them so much that if they had to travel north to south and, the, and Samaria was in the middle, they would make a long trip around Samaria. <laughs> Because they didn't want to get polluted by even coming into contact with them or walking through their land. But yet it was Jesus who said he must needs go through Samaria. He told the disciples that later in the Great Commission too, remember, beginning at Jerusalem and spreading out into Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. The gospel is always intended for all people in, in God's big plan it just took a while to mankind to to get there but he must needs go through samaria now jesus goes down there and it tells us something about the humanity of christ it's, it's the middle of the day i'm assuming it was a hot dusty day they've been traveling they need something to eat he sent the disciples to go find some food and jesus sits down there on the wheel on the well and the bible says being wearied he was tired and as he's sitting there on, on the well, here comes this Samaritan woman by herself, it looks like, to draw some water in her water pot. I want to preach about the woman's water pot today. It, a water pot was a precious item in that day. We take that for granted sometimes because uh, in this age we live in, if you just run to Walmart when you need something. But in that day, a, a water pot was something that uh, somebody had to be in the community that had a skill to make that, to, to, to make it with their hands, and then put it in a kiln and fire that thing just right so it didn't bust. And it was really not only an artistic item, but a highly functional item. Every home need one. No running water in the home. You needed a water pot. And for cooking and other things, water pots were really valuable. And a lot of things were artistic and functional until we entered into this disposable age that we live in. That's why we take it and just gloss over that sometimes. But it says that she, when, Jesus, when she talked to Jesus and she left, the Bible makes the point that she left her water pot behind. Now, the first time I ever read that, I thought, that's curious that she would leave her water pot behind. And, and I've always thought, as I've, I've tried to sit it and ask myself and ask the Lord, why did she leave her water pot behind? And, and I've, I've always thought this all my Christian life. I thought, well, I understand that she's figured out who Jesus is. She runs to town and she tells all the people, says, come see a man who knows all about me. He's told me everything. Come see this man. So I can relate to that. She's been in the presence of Jesus. She's had communication with Jesus. And she just got excited and ran off and left her water pot behind. I can dig that. <laughs> she figured out who Jesus was and she couldn't wait to tell others. Now, there's something in this text, too, that the woman come at midday. I've read that the women 
that was the daily chores, and they would usually come first thing at first light, and it was a kind of a social gathering too. All the all the housewives would come with their water pots, and they'd be getting water for the home during the day and swap tails and everything. And then later in the evening, maybe before dark, come back and get water again, but people didn't go, women didn't go at the middle of the day to get their water normally. But it could be, and this is just conjecture, we're just reading the Bible and thinking between the lines trying to figure things out. It could be that we do know this much from the text that this woman had a little bit of questionable background in her character. Jesus told her to go get her husband. He wanted to talk. Now, Jesus knew this. He's drawing this out, right? It had been revealed to him from the Father, I assume. And she, he said, go, go bring your husband. I'll talk to him, too. And she said, I don't have a husband. Normally, that would have been it, right? I'm single. And Jesus said, you got that right. You don't have a husband. said, you've had five husbands. Now you're shacked up with another guy. <laughs> Maybe why she was there in the middle of the day instead of being there when the other women were there. Now you've got not only the culture shock that the disciples were experiencing when they come back and they found Jesus talking to a Samaritan, but talking to a woman and talking to a woman of questionable character. But yet it might have been this very woman that was on the heart of the Lord that he had to, must needs go down to Samaria and reach out to. And we've read the rest of the story. She became the Samaritan evangelist that went to town and told everybody about Jesus and brought them back. Before we leave that, I do want to say one thing, though. Uh, I don't want to read this verse without bringing this out because it's preached differently today and I'm telling you they're wrong. This verse just proves it wrong. Jesus did not tell her you have five living husbands. He said you have had five husbands. Now Jesus was not encouraging serial monogamy either. God's perfect plan is still one man and one woman for life until death do us part. But for whatever the reason, Jesus did recognize that those other ones were not her husbands anymore because she had zero husbands. And she shacked up with another one that was not her husband. That's the words of Jesus himself. Now, when he told the woman that, did you notice what she did? She did what human nature does. <laughs> A bomb had just been dropped on her, and Jesus was probing to the depths of her personal life. So she wants to change the subject real quickly. <laughs> Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. You're a religious man. Let me ask you a religious question. Sometimes when people ask you religious questions, it's really just to deflect from the personal thing. Our fathers, us Samaritans, they said we're supposed to worship right over here on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. But you Jews say that we're supposed to go to Jerusalem and worship the Lord in Jerusalem. Jesus said, the hour are coming that you're not going to have to go there and you're not going to have to go there because God's a spirit and God's going to be worshipped in a spiritual way. But at that time, there was still that thing where you took your sacrifice to the temple. And the Samaritan's temple was at Mount Gerizim because they couldn't go to Jerusalem. There's too much animosity and hatred but there between the Samaritans and the Jews. Hold that thought. Jesus said, that's going to change, though. Now, here's what changed with me this week. That may be right. I don't know. I'm just guessing. The woman may have got excited about meeting Jesus and ran and left her water pot there. But it might have been, too. This is the first time I ever had this thought. Maybe she didn't forget it. Maybe she left it on purpose. Because first of all, she's already pointed out that Jesus is hot and thirsty and you don't have, sir, you don't have anything to draw with. He does now. While she's gone, he can drink out of her water pot. Didn't you feel like that when you first got saved? Lord, what can I do for you? Amen. And every, we may not, and Jesus don't need our water pot maybe. 
But every one of us has got something that we can offer to Jesus that he can use. We're given so much time in our life, we don't know how much time we've got, but that time can be used to serve Jesus. Everybody is given some sort of gift that can be used in the kingdom of God, your time and your talents. You can use something in your talents that God's give you that you can make a difference for the kingdom of God. We come here and we, we sort of gloss over it, but our offering is something that's used in the service of God. Our time, our talents, and our treasure we can offer to the Lord. She left him a very valuable water pot to get a drink that day. Or, or maybe, I got to thinking about that, maybe she didn't forget it. She left it on purpose not only because Jesus could use it, but she knew she was coming back. I'll get my water pot when I come back, right? <laughs> I think anybody that meets Jesus knows that they're coming back. I know anybody that meets Jesus, they can't wait till the church house opens up again so they're coming back <laughs> because they want to be there. That's where they met Jesus in a special way, and that's where they go and worship with Jesus in, in a special way and, and, and because they want to come back, not because they're guilt-driven and they have to come back because they want to come back. That's just how it happens. There's something on the inside called grace that drives us back. Amen. I know oxes fall in the ditch. But I know when a Christian's ox falls in the ditch and they can't be there, they're grieved that they had to miss that day because they want to be there. Look at verse 23 at the bottom for just a minute. Here's an answer. Why did the Lord save you? You ever think about that? You ever just sit around and philosophize and say, Lord, uh, um, I'm glad I'm saved. Why didn't you just beam me up, Scotty? Or beam me up Jesus in this case. When I got saved, Lord, why didn't I'm, I'm on my way to heaven. Now, if, if we only got saved so we could go to heaven, then wouldn't Jesus have been better off just go ahead and zap us out of here right at that moment? <laughs> Everybody's personal rapture and per, occurs with their personal salvation, right? <laughs> we know that wouldn't work. There wouldn't be any Christians in the world, would they? But boy, if I'd, got, if I'd have got beamed out of here the moment that I got saved, wouldn't that have been great? I would have never sinned after I got saved. <laughs> I would have never done the first thing wrong because I'd got beamed out of here just the moment that I got saved. But we're saved for a purpose. Maybe we don't teach that enough. Maybe Christians haven't made that connection. To, we are saved for a purpose. And, and what is that purpose? The, it's the bottom of verse 23, Jesus answers it to us. The Father seeks such to worship him. You're saved to be part of the called out assembly that worships God. That's the testimony of, of the Christian church that we assemble to worship. That's the reason that the Lord saved us to worship him. Not And now we can keep unpeeling that onion a little bit deeper. It's not that God has to, like, like God's got some kind of pride problem and he has to be worshiped. That's backwards. God knows that we need to worship him because you become like what you worship. God wants his people to be more like him. That occurs in worship. He seeks such to worship because it's in the worship that we are empowered to go out and serve God. That's why the Lord saved us. Look at verse 20 here as we wind down. I know we set our clocks forward this morning and I was asleep when I started and you're probably asleep before I finish you. I said she deflected this question earlier. Like, like Lord, uh, she, you know, the Lord drilled down on her personal life. And she says, let me ask you a question I've been wondering. Let me ask you about something in the Bible people do today. Right? It has nothing to do with them or what she's talking about. But it's a deflection. So she said, should we worship here the way our father said? Or should we worship in Jerusalem the way the Jews say? What do you say? Since I perceive that you're a prophet, Jesus... Where should we worship at? Her question is, and it's a good one. She's just deflect, deflecting, but it was a question of the time, the debate, right? Where's the right place to worship? 
Where, where, where can I best meet God in the sacrifice? Because that's how you did it back then, right? According to, to the prescribed ordinances, you'd, you'd take your sacrifice and the sacrifice, and God would meet with you in the sacrifice. And Jesus said, there's time coming, it ain't going to be about the place. You're not going to have to go to Mount Gerizim, and you're not going to have to go to uh, Jerusalem, but on this side of the cross, I can tell you that you go to Mount Calvary. Amen. You meet Jesus in the sacrifice of Mount Calvary. All those other ones were pointing up to him, the God-man. It wasn't the blood of goats and bulls could take away sin. They was just IOUs pointing to the blood of Christ, which could take away our sin because he was the sinless man who could die in our place. He was God, but he is also human and it took a human to die in our place i can answer that question you worship at mount calvary's where you worship at today and, and the testimony of others is good but as these folks from the city said we've heard him ourselves <laughs> we've heard him ourselves you probably first hear of jesus from somebody else but somewhere in those words or that reading, or whatever way it was, you hear, not with your ears, but in the depths of your soul, God speaking to you. And when you hear him yourself, and saying in many different ways, but it all boils down to the same one, to use one in Proverbs, I think, or Psalms, my, my child, give me your heart. It's what God wants us Give him our inmost being. He'll do something with us. He'll make something out of us that he intends for us to be. I hope that if you've never heard the Lord, that today, right now, at this particular time, that you've heard him yourself. Not just heard the preacher, but heard the Lord speak to you of your need to salvation. If it is, answer him. If you're in the church house, answer him at this altar this morning. If you're watching on the computer screen, Make an altar of your desk or your couch, wherever you're at right then, and just say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I want to place my trust in Christ. And then the Bible teaches us then the next step is that you tell somebody. Confession's made with the mouth. That seals the deal, see? It seals it for you. And it's, and it's a blessing to somebody. That if you tell some other Christian that you've trusted in the Lord, you've made their day. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the good word of God. As we read these ancient stories from 2,000 years ago, how the tired Jesus sat on a well and communicated with a, a woman that had questionable character. We do know from the rest of the Bible that all human beings have questionable character and we're in need of forgiveness and grace. And we thank you that you're always willing to reach out and talk to us and have an honest conversation about ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.